uh, OCT basics and uh, our Vijay Kumar is here. He will explain everything what we need to know. Vijay, please. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Saravanan. Let me share this thing. Yeah. Can you see my slides now? Yes, you can see that now. You can go with the slideshow. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Saranen and Morgan, for this opportunity. And uh, uh, after a great talk, it's a very simple one. And uh, I try to finish uh, within 30 minutes. If it goes over that, then you can stop me at any time. So, uh, intravascular imaging, uh, we have two commonly used modalities. One is IVIS, the sound-based modality. The second one is uh, OCT, our light-based modality. Whether you use IVAS or OCT, both give ad useful additional information that supplement your coronary angiography in improving procedure outcomes. For the next 30 minutes, uh, we just go through the following aspects of OCT imaging, starting with image formation, then few words about image display and orientation, and a uh, little length about uh, image interpretation, artifacts, and finally, ending with stent optimization. So how does this light interact with the tissue? So before going into the details, we should understand two terminologies. One is the tissue interface. Tissue interface is nothing but it is a border or border between the two media with the different refractory index. Refractory index is nothing but resistance to passage of light in a media. So how does this light interact with the tissue? It depends on three factors. One is the angle of incidence, whether it is the perpendicular or non-perpendicular. The second one is the smoothness of the interface, whether it is a smooth regular surface or an irregular surface. The third one is the difference between difference in the refractory index between the media. Okay, these are the three factors determine the, the re, uh, re interaction between light and tissue. Take this example here: the light photons. This is your first interface. They come and interact perpendicularly. They get reflected, depends on the difference in the refractive index between your lumen, the first interface, that is your indima. So if it is, uh, the, the difference is a lot, because there's a, if it is a great uh, difference in the refractive index between these two media, there is a lot of reflection happening at the interface. If it is a less difference, and uh, part of the wave is allowed to go through, that is called a transmission to the next interface. They get reflected from the next interface. Then again, part of it is allowed to go through third interface and again gets reflected. This is what happens, suppose you have a regular surface and a perpendicular interaction between the uh, light and tissue. Suppose if the surface is irregular, what happens? The light gets reflected in multiple directions and only small part of it reaches back your uh, transducer. That is what happens in regular OCT imaging. So this is called a scattering. So whatever comes back to the transducer is called backscattered base. Okay? Suppose it interacts at an angle. What happens? They get reflected at the same similar angle away from your transducer. Again, it does not take part in formation of your image. And if it is allowed to go through in a media with a uh, uh, lot of difference in the refractive index, it gets uh, deviated from its normal path. It is called refraction. So these are the basic uh, parameters of uh, light and uh, tissue interaction. This is very important to understand to understand the basic image interpretation and artifacts. Okay, moving forward, there are two reasons why you don't see the deeper part of the tissue clearly. One is due to shadowing. Suppose you have the refractive index between two media it is if it is a lot a large difference in the refractive index most of the ways they get reflected from the surface itself so you can see only the leading edge of the tissue the remaining all uh, buried in the shadow so this is called shadowing so this is one type of artifact usually occurs when you have a, a highly reflecting uh, surfaces like the uh, stent studs and uh, your guide wires in so, there is another reason where you have loss of uh, a visibility of deeper tissue that is called attenuation. Attenuation is nothing but absorption, that is conversion of your light energy into heat energy. So that results in 
the loss of uh, forward moving energy waves then other reasons are due to scattering and the reflection so due to these three reasons the light wave just get lost in the tissue this is then that causes shadowing over the deeper tissues that is called attenuation so both are different phenomena this is shadowing it all get reflected from the surface that's why you don't see anything deeper here the light waves get lost in the tissue due to heat formation that is absorption or due to reflection or or due to scattering so these things result in loss of strength of this light waves that causes attenuation of the deeper tissue suppose you have a uh, light waves come into contact with smaller structures like uh, rbc they get scattered and all all around so that's why you have to clear your rbc before you do your oct imaging okay moving forward so what are the basic things you require for an imaging information the two information one is a depth information that means where exactly your structure is located in the vessel wall the second that is determined by the time of flight that means the time taken for the light wave to go to the interface and coming back to the so this is a to and fro travel time so that it determines where exactly your structure is located so this travel time gives you the depth information that is how so this is the nearest structure far away and bit more away from your transducer that is how this uh, oct system determines what is the depth of the structure the second thing important thing is what is the intensity of the reflected signal so that is the second characteristic so higher the intensity brighter your structure lower the reflected intensity darker your structure so these are the two parameters that helps in formation of imaging so here there is how it happens just here you see the light waves go get reflected it forms one layer second third and like that so this goes around there is how the oct image is formed Okay, you can just so this is how you get regular OCT images. So this is uh, deeper tissue and brighter means higher reflection, and the middle and it is darker that means less reflection. This is superficial and higher reflection. This comes back early. This is a little later. And this is much later. So that is how the system defines where exactly it is located and what is the intensity of the reflection. Okay. So what are the basic differences between IVS and OCT? IVS is a uh, a sound based modality oct is a light based modality and oct has 10 times more resolution comparing to ivs and it has 18 to 36 times rapid pullback speed comparing to ivs uh, but uh, there are two main limitations one is the field of view it is about 1 cm uh, for your oct and it is about 2 cm uh, for your ivs and the tissue penetration have again about a centimeter for your both ivs and it is about 2 to 3 mm for oct and another important limitation is need for contrast injection so you have to clear all the rbcs because they cause intense scatter so you need to inject contrast hence it is not applicable in patients who is undergoing tto lesion for procedure guidance and the left main osteo lesion or your osteo lesion and in patients with renal failure and if you see the utility of oct comparing to ivs oct is much better than for characterizing all aspects of your atherosclerosis and except for plaque burden because it requires depth penetration and again if you see if all post pcs stent evaluation oct is much better than ivs because of its high resolution and to come moving on to the image display both ivs and oct forms images which look like histological sections they do not have rotational orientation you describe images as if you are viewing the face of the clock such as you have some abnormality extending from 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock something from 7 to 8 o'clock you don't say that which is anterior and posterior because it is not possible with ivs imaging unless you have your external markers same applies to oct because of its poor penetration even more difficult with oct and image orientation if you remember all your echo and the ct images are oriented as if you are standing at the foot of the other patient and looking ahead but here oct and ivs images are oriented as if you are sitting inside the aortic root and looking into the ostium of the coronary artery so all the images are oriented from the ostium of the coronary artery rather than from the distal part okay how does this uh, normal vessel appears on oct image oct and ivs imaging both look alike except for high resolution images with oct 
So the normal vessel has two parts. One is echolucent uh, lumen with the imaging catheter. And the second part is the three-layered vessel wall, the bright intima, dark media, and the bright adventitia. It produces a bright, dark, bright appearance. Okay? This is how normal vessel appears. So what are the various parameters you, we use to characterize the tissues with OCT? There are five parameters. One is back scatter. Back scatter is nothing but brightness of the reflected signal. Attenuation, as we already explained, it is the loss of the signals in the deeper part of the tissue from absorption or scattering. Uh, simply, it is the penetration depth of your image. The third one is composition. Either it is the similar elements that is homogeneous, dissimilar elements that is homogeneous. The fourth one is the texture, whether it is a coarse texture or a fine texture. And the fifth one is edge or border, whether you have a sharp border or a diffuse border. So use all these parameters to characterize these images. See the first image here. This is the homogeneous structure and the high backscatter because it appears bright and the low attenuation because you are able to see the deeper structures. We have these three characteristics, homogeneous, high backscatter and low attenuation, fibrous tissue. And see the second image here. It is low backscatter because it appears dark. It is high attenuation because you are not able to see the deeper structures. And it is a homogeneous because it is made up of similar elements. And if you see the borders, it is diffuse. You are not able to see where exactly the tissues, uh, tissue abnormality starts and ends. So this is the diffuse border. If it has these four parameters, this is your liquid plot. And you see the images here. You see here, one, this structure is heterogeneous because it is made up of similar elements. And it is uh, hypoechoic, so it means less, less backscatter. And you see the depth penetration, you have a good depth penetration, you're able to see beyond the block. And you see the borders comparing to this one, it is the pencil line clear borders. If you have these four features, it is your fibrocastic block. These are the three common features you see in daily practice. Going into luminal abnormalities, if you have an intraluminal mass with the high backscatter on the surface and the high attenuation deeper part, so this is your red thrombus. You see a structure here, it is again, it is a high backscattering structure because it appears bright and a low attenuating because you are able to see the deeper structures. That is your white thrombus. And what is your recanalized thrombus? Recanalized thrombus is nothing but intraluminal mass with the channels and the intact media. This is uh, your uh, intramural hematoma. This, even though it is not an intraluminal abnormality, I put it here because it is often confused with your recanalized thrombus once you develop channels in the uh, uh, in this thrombotic part. So how do you differentiate? You just see here media. Here the media is continuous all around. Here you see the media. Media is split and there is accumulation of blood in the media. This is your spontaneous coronary dissection. So there are features. OCT identifies the multiple features that helps in understanding vulnerability of the plot for uh, rupture. So what are the features? First feature is lipid rich plot. Lipid rich plot is nothing but lipid occupying more than 180 degrees of the circumference. What is your thin cap fibrotheroma? Thin cap fibrotheroma is a lipid rich block with a thin fibrous cap measuring less than 65 microns in thickness. Because of its high resolution, you are able to measure the exact thickness of your fibrous cap. What is a microchannel? Microchannel is nothing but intra plot signal voids measuring about 50 to 300 microns in diameter. And what is your macrophage? Macrophage is nothing but a series of signals which starts with the deep signal attenuation. So that is your macrophage. What is your cholesterol crystal? Which appears similar to your macrophage, but there is more signal attenuation. You are able to see the deeper parts. That is your cholesterol crystal. And the last one is the spotty calcification. Spotty calcification is nothing but a calcium that is extending less than 90 degrees of the circumference. So these are the six features that make your plot prone for the rupture. And because of this higher resolution, OCT clearly identifies underlying pathology in acute coronary syndrome. There are three types of pathologies classified with OCT. One is with the description of the fibrous gap. There are two underlying pathologies. One, if you have an underlying lipid, it is called the plaque rupture. Here you can just see that with an underlying uh, necrotic core plaque, which is just ruptured and discharged all the contents into the lumen on the canopy. So this is the typical appearance of block rupture. This constitutes about 65% of all your AC, all your ACS. The second one is you can again you can just see that there is a description of your fibrous cap and the protruding calcium into the lumen. This is the 
third common abnormality that is called the calcified module. It constitutes about 5% of all your ACS. And the last one is your erosion. Erosion is nothing but the intact fibrous cap that is superimposed with compass. This constitutes about 25% of all your ACS. The less common causes are tight stenosis. We all know tight stenosis causes ACS. The second one is your spasm, sprints metal angina. Here, how do you identify spasm? Here you can just see that in folding of intima in the thick media. So this is how the spasmodic segment appears in OCT imaging. This is uh, what it happens after your uh, nitroglycerin injection. This one is the spontaneous thermary dissection, which constitutes about the 2% of all your ACS, more commonly in middle-aged females. You identify it by, as already explained, split in the media with the blood in the medial space. The last one is your fissure. So these are the various rare causes of the ACS. And OCT helps in identifying all these features uh, uh, in a patient presenting with ACS. And we all know most important mechanism of plaque progression is the healing of the plaque rupture and erosion. So how does it appear on OCT imaging? OCT imaging produces uh, uh, an appearance. It's a multi-layered appearance with a different signal intensity. You can just see here, here one layer with a, a brightness and here the dark with the lipid. So layered appearance is a typical of your healed coronary plaque. And moving on to OCT artifacts, OCT facts are divided into five types. One is artifact related to imaging techniques. Second one is artifact related to image processing. Third one, artifact related to imaging catheter or guide wire. Fourth one, artifact related to stent structures. And the last one is artifact related to position. This will start with uh, artifact related to imaging techniques. There are two artifacts. First one is called obliquity artifact. For you to get this round type of image, your imaging catheter has to be parallel to the vessel. So you just see that this is one uh, one wall, the other wall, and the imaging catheter is parallel to the walls, and you get the nice round, round image like this. Suppose your catheter is non-parallelly aligned, what you get, because all the images are formed perpendicular to the catheter. So suppose it is eccentrically aligned, you get the image, oblique image. So this is not a real um, uh, circumference of your vessel. So you just see this is the real one and this is what you get in public with the artifact. So this artifact results from non-parallel alignment of your imaging catheter that result in oblique, uh, elliptically distorted half active images. Usually occurs in the vessel curvature or tortuosity and what is the clinical importance? It makes your measurement less accurate. You should not make this measurement and select your balloon or strength. It is very very important to understand this artifact. The second one is residual blood artifact. The most important one you see in everyday practice that results from suboptimal flushing. It produces a signal rich swelling pattern within the human. And the clinical importance is should not be identified as red thrombus because it's almost like a red thrombus. It may limit the characterization of underlying tissue. You are not able to see the underlying tissue clearly. The secondly, the artifacts related to image processing. There are three artifacts. The first one is the your SU art artifact. If you know, this imaging catheter has to remain in the same position till it forms a 360 degree image. Suppose it moves forward or backward, that produces combination of two sections rather than a single cross section. That produces an artifact called SU of or step artifact. Nothing but single radius of small alignment in the circumferential image that results from rapid movement of your artery or imaging catheter. Usually occurs in AV group arteries such as LCX and RCA, which move rapidly with your cardiac cycle. The second one is again, this catheter has to rotate at a constant speed along the circumference to form the normal image. Suppose there is a reduction in the speed along the part of the circumference that produces a smearing, that is onion feel like appearance in the part of the image where the catheter rotation is slower. That is called non-uniform rotational deformity because it results from non-uniform rotation of the catheter. Okay. Usually it occurs in the vessel tortuosity, tight stenosis, heavy calcification or equipment imperfection. And the third artifact is called as fold over artifact. We already explained with the field of view of OCT is limited. Suppose you encounter a big vessel like a, such as left main bifurcation. The refractive signals usually come from the beyond the field of view of the system. 
like that results in aliasing in the Fourier transformation. So what exactly happens during your pulse wave Doppler imaging where you get when the velocity goes beyond the system limit that produces aliasing or fold over. This uh, uh, information is folded toward the opposite side. The same thing happens here. You can just see that this is your branch and uh, branch instead of as a round image produces a folded image. So that results from you are aliasing in the Fourier transformation. This is called the fold over artifact. Usually occurs in the large vessels and the side branches such as left mine. There are two artifacts that are related from imaging catheter or guide wire called as uh, uh, first one is a shadow. I told you wherever the light rays get reflected from the surface, the remaining part all cause, causes shadow. So it occurs due to uh, three main reasons. One is the guide wire and metallic sensors because they do reflect the light very strongly that then allow it to pass through the cause of shadowing. Another important avoidable cause of the shadowing is the small bubbles. If you have bubbles present in your sleeve covering your catheter, it can cause the shadowing on the deeper structures. What is the clinical importance? It limits the evaluation of the underlying structures. And another thing is the multiple reflection artifact. It is nothing but multiple reflections happening between the transducer and your imaging sleeve. I am not sure whether you are able to see that produces circle artifacts centered on your imaging catheter. So this is what happens. So you just see that the strongly reflecting surface reflected back multiple times. That forms ghost artifacts exactly the multiple of the differences. Because if it reflects back two times, it, the system counts it as the two, twice the length it has traveled. Suppose it is uh, five, 10 microns. It reflects two times it counts as 10 microns. Then system feels that the images come from 10 micron distance rather than the 5 micron distance. So that is how this the ghost images are formed at the exactly multiple distances of your original structure. So this is your original normal structure. The ghost image is formed here exactly multiple of this distance. Okay. So this is called multiple reflection artifact. So the stent studs, again, the most important cause of an artifact. This is actually actual stent stud. This is your luminal surface and this is your subluminal surface. So what actually happens when the light rays come and get reflected from the surface, because it is an intensely reflecting structure, it doesn't allow the light rays to pass through the stent stud itself. So you can see only the leading edge or the luminal surface here of your stent stud. This part is not visible on your OCT image. In addition, because it is highly reflecting structure, like a mirror light on a mirror, it forms a glare on the surface. So that is called blooming. This is actually, this blue part is an actually an artifact, and this is the actual surface. The black part is not visible on your OCT image. So the actual stent set starts somewhere in the middle of the structure, what you see. So this is the structure you, you see exactly the middle of the structure where, that is where your real stent set starts. So you have to make all the measurements in the middle of the structure what is visible on your OCT imaging, particularly for your Mahler position measurement. So there are few artifacts that are related to stent struts and the first one is a reverberation. It is exactly the multiple reflection artifact we saw earlier. Again, the stent sets are highly reflecting surface that results in multiple reflection artifacts that is called reverberations. Okay, this is. And again, it is a highly reflective, again, all related to high reflectivity of stent sets. But when this reflectivity is beyond the dynamic range of your OCP system, that results in formation of streaks. You can just see the spokes like artifact, which is, which is centered on your uh, stent sets, goes to the catheter and goes beyond into the vessel. So this is called saturation or streak artifact that occur due to stents. And there are four artifacts that are related to eccentric wire position. So for you to get a nice image, the catheter should be in the middle of the lumen. Then all the rays form perpendicular to get a nice image of the vessel. When it is eccentric, that results in high intensity signals close to the vessel. You should not mistake this one for a fibrous plant or something. It is nothing but it is uh, because of the proximity of the catheter to the vessel wall. So it is called proximity artifact. The second one is called tangential signal dropout. It is nothing but I already explained to you 
for you to get a proper image the vessel has to be in the catheter has to be in the center all has to be perpendicular to the vessel wall to get the images when it is eccentric the light rays go parallel rather than perpendicular to the vessel surface that result in loss of signals tangential to your catheter so this you should not mistake it for a lipid rich block so this is called as tangential signal dropout whenever you see this type of image you always see the catheter position before labeling this one as a, a lipid rich block okay two other artifacts that result from eccentric catheter position the one is called marigo round artifact for you to get a nice image a nice sharp image of sensors you should the catheter should be close to the sensors when it goes away there is a less le reduction in the lateral resolution lateral resolution is nothing but the distance between the light rays suppose you have sensed it here the distance is very small so you can see get a crisp image of your sensors when you travel longer from your catheter the distance is longer the automatically your lateral resolution comes down so that result in less distant wide images of your sensors like what you get in marigo row you just stand on one side of marigo row you see the far end image that looks like it is more elongated than the normal so this is called marigo row artifact the last artifact is called sunflower artifact when the catheter is located is uh, located in the middle you just see the sensors symmetrically and perpendicular suppose it is located eccentrically it sees the sensor in an angle so as if for the sensor is located at an angle to the uh, catheter so then the reflected images also forms at an angle looking towards the catheter so this is called the sunflower artifact as the all the sunflower looking into sun here all the sensors they look into the catheter so this is called the sunflower artifact okay this concludes the artifact session now we move on to how to use this one to guide your procedure okay so what are the ways you guide your procedure one is uh, evaluation of plaque characteristics and lesion preparation appropriateness of stent sizing the third one is optimization of stent deployment and fourth one is evaluation of device failure the first one is you have to know whether the lesion is going to produce no flow or not how do you identify that the most important enemy of your pci is the presence of a lipid rich block so that is the main cause of your no flow when you have a lipid with an arc of more than 180 degrees that may precipitate no flow during your procedure so you should avoid aggressive lesion preparation in this type of lesion in contrast when you have calcium again it is a main predictor of your stent expansion so you have to look into the following characteristics what is the calcium angle and they create a score when the angle is more than 180 to give two points and calcium thickness is more than 0.5 mm there is one point calcium length more than 5 mm is one point when you have your score three or more you need some form of atherectomy to prepare the lesion otherwise you end up with under expansion so how do you size your stent so the stent sizing is based on the vessel dimensions of the smallest reference reference is nothing but it is a normal set, normal area, normal appearing vessel proximal and distal to the lesion here you can just see that this is your lesion and uh, just move proximally towards the guiding catheter that is your proximal normal zone this is the one normal appearing vessel proximally and move distally and here you can just see that normal vessel appearing distally this is your distal reference so this is your distal reference this is your proximal reference and if you see that you measure your lumen dimensions so mean it is your mean lumen dimension that is average your lumen dimension is 2.6 you measure maximum dimension minimum dimension take an average that is 2.6 and you to measure external elastic membrane that is your vessel dimension so this is a mean of maximum and minimum this is 2.8 mm similarly you do proximally uh, average lumen diameter is 3 average el diameter 3.25 and your thin size depends on the smallest vessel dimension you can use either the lumen dimension or your external elastic membrane dimension if you use lumen dimension you just round higher up to go by round up to next to 0.25 it is 0.26 so you select a 2.75 stent suppose you use a el uh, then you just round down 
two nearest point two five. That means two point eight means you round down your stem to two point seven five. That is how you select your stem. What is the length of the stem? Length is the distance between the proximal and distal reference. So here we selected a two point five into fifteen millimeters. Okay. And once you put the stent in, we have to see six parameters of optimal stent deployment. One is expansion, second one is opposition, third one is the uh, edge, edge uh, geographic mist, and fourth one is the dissection, fifth one is hematoma, and sixth one is the lens. Just go through briefly all the parameters. If you see expansion, you take any of the studies, expansion is the most important parameter to predict either stent thrombosis or stent restenosis. How do you define your stent expansion? Stent expansion is quantified based on the minimal stent cross area. Two ways of expressing it. One is relative to the reference lumen area, which is either proximal, distal, or combined. Or the second way is express it as an absolute lumen area. So what is the relative stent expansion? There are so many criteria that have been described in literature, starting from uh, more than 80% of average to more than 90% of the distal or more than 90% of the average, or separately defined for proximal loft and distal loft as proximal loft more than 90% of the proximal reference, distal loft more than 90% of the distal reference. There are so many criteria that have been used in practice. What is the uh, problems with relative stand expansion criteria? You see that different things. And if you see the success rate, how much they achieved in the study, it's about only 50 to 55%. So that means there is some problem with this criteria. So many of the trials did not achieve the protocol required stent expansion, albeit the guidance related clinical be benefits still emerged, even though it could not achieve, still they achieved more benefit comparing to angiographic procedures. Achieving more than 90% of the expansion is ambitious and frequently out of reach. Almost most studies which use more than 90% of average diameter, they reached only 45 to 50% of the patients achieving this criteria. And less stringent criteria, stringent criteria such as 80%, results in more number of patients achieving the optimal expansion. So then moving to uh, absolute uh, area criteria, there are various criteria that have been proposed that is based on the follow-up lumen area of more than 4 millimeters square. That is considered to be non-flow limiting traditionally. So what about BMS? It is 6.5 millimeters square. Serolimus elliptic stent, it is 5 millimeters square. Taclitax elliptic stent, it is 5.7 millimeters. Everolimus saluting 5.3, Zotrolimus saluting 5.4. It is about average of 5.5 millimeters square by IVAS. What about OCT? It is for bare metal stent, it is 5.5 millimeters, it is much smaller than IVAS. And for drug routing stent, it is 5 millimeters square. In other studies have shown that it is about 4.5 millimeters square. So it varies between 4.5 to 5 for drug routing stent, 5, 5 to 5.5 millimeters square for bare metal stent. Suppose you use a smaller stent, that is a stent less than or equal to 2.5 millimeter, you should aim for an area of 3.5 millimeter square. So what is again problem of absolute area criteria? The cutoff may not be achievable in small vessels in about 30% and uh, may not be appropriate uh, in bigger vessels, it may result in undersizing. And there is a stepwise decrease in the event rate. Bigger the area, smaller the event rate. And evidence exists for cutoff for absolute stent expansion that predicts the future events differ between Biometal stent, it is much higher for biometal stent, smaller for drug routing stent, and bigger for IVAS and smaller for OCT. So it's a lot of the variation in the areas. And you have to apply different criteria in case of left mind, even though there's no criteria for OCT, for IVAS you have to apply different criteria for OCT. So these are the various problems with the absolute area criteria. Why all these things happen? Because suppose you have a vessel like RCA where there is no branch, you can use any of the criteria which is appropriate. Suppose you have a vessel like left main, which has the two main big branches. Suppose you have to a crossover from here to here. This is a big variation in your meters. Suppose you take a vessel like LAD, where there's a lot of branches and gradually taper to, towards this thing. So this taper branching, these are the two things which result in variations in the uh, criteria applied in different settings. So what is the appropriate expansion criteria? The most appropriate criteria will be volume-based criteria, volume-based assessment of expansion. So what it does, it takes into account uh, the vessel tapering and the branches where there is a, a big step up, step down in the vessel dimensions. So this is how it is done. It is available in the latest OCT systems. This takes a lumen profile and uh, al also based on your reference and the branch origin and size, it gives an ideal lumen profile. 
and compares these two and gives the frame by frame stand expansion parameter. And what you measure is minimum expansion index, that is the smallest expansion that is observed in this segment. So this is how ideally you measure that is available in the current version of the OCT systems. Okay. So what the current guideline recommends? The current guideline recommends a relative expansion criteria of more than 80% of average of the both the reference human area. Or if you want to go for an absolute carrier criteria for an IVS, it should be more than 5.5 millimeters square. For OCT, it should be more than 4.45 millimeters square. Moving on to the example here. So this is a case we saw of the stent deployment. You see that distal reference is 6, proximal reference is 6. The stent area is 6.6 .6 millimeters square. So that means if you take an average, it is 6, it is more than 6. So the stent is well expanded, whatever criteria you apply. You apply distal 90%, proximal 90% criteria, or use an average criteria, the stent is well expanded. You have a short stent, and there is not much tapering, there is no problem in estimating. Otherwise, you have to use the volume expansion, volumetric criteria for a stent expansion. Moving on to molar position. Molar position is lack of contact between the stent steps and the vessel wall. It can occur either acutely or during follow-up. Acute molar position occurs due to two reasons. One is you have uh, correctly selected stent but under deploy or an undersized stent. Either undersizing related or under deployment related or block related. Block related means you have a calcified block that does not allow your stent steps move towards the vessel wall. That is called the block related molar position. Smaller position can be noticed during follow-up, which can either due to a uh, baseline smaller position, which can either persist during follow-up, or it may disappear due to neo intimal growth. Or the smaller position can develop during follow-up. That means it doesn't exist during the initial procedure. Occur due to two reasons. One is from vessel remodeling. Uh, that is the most important and the clinically important one for your stent thrombosis. The second one is least important that results from uh, a thrombus resolution in ACS patients. Okay. So how do you measure mal opposition? We already explained. And there are three types of opposition. One is embedded. Embedded means more than 50% of the stent cells moved into the vessel wall. The second one is the protruding. That means stent is opposed to the vessel but not deep into the vessel wall. The third one is mal opposition. This is how you classify your opposition, embedded, protruding, and the mal opposed. Okay, so what is what about the late persistent mal opposition? So what is a mal opposition that can be safely left alone? The two, one uh, study from Japan, which has shown that so for a first generation stent, regrouting stent, it is about 285 microns. For a second generation stent, it is about 355 microns. So roughly about 400 micron is a, a, a distance that predicts uh, the spontaneous resolution of mal opposition during your follow-up. And you just see that none of the studies have shown an opposition with uh, 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 clinical outcomes, provided that the stent is optimally explained. So you, pro you deployed your stent well, and you have mal opposition, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, however, what has happened, it is about the study, 10-year follow-up study from Asan Medical Center, Korea, which has shown that late acquired mal opposition that I told you, that is mal opposition that acquires during follow-up, that results from vessel wall toxicity from the drug, that can result in increased incidence of maced events and the stent thrombosis. Okay? So, but even though there is no difference in the death and the target vessel myocardial infarction or target prevascular resolution. So, only mal opposition, you are worried in the well deployed stent is late acquired mal opposition. So these are the stent studies which have just looked into various parameters that are resulting in follow-up stent thrombosis. So here mal opposition is an important parameter. These studies have shown that any mal opposition, which is more than 400 microns in, in the distance and more than 1 millimeter in length, is the what commonly observed in patients presenting with the stent thrombosis. So what does the guideline recommends? Guideline recommends uh, and not to address any molar position which is less than 0.4 millimeter uh, in the in the diameter or extending less than one millimeter so you should not uh, try to address this one so anything more than this you try to correct it with the further balloon dilatation okay.
and what about geographic miss i will just finish in 5 minutes time okay so geographic miss is nothing but length of injured osteotic vessel that is not fully covered by your stent occurs in two dimensions one is your longitudinal geographic miss that results from balloon injury to the edge and the second one is the uncovered clot that is called longitudinal geographic miss and axial geographic miss is a wrongly sized balloon or stent so this is your axial geographic miss and geographic miss results in poor outcomes during your follow up so how do you select your stent landing zone so this is a summary of multiple studies we just see that geographic miss an important predictor of follow up outcomes and this is ivs so in a diffused vessel if you have a normal vessel in the landing zone that is okay suppose you have a diffuse diseased vessel how do you select your landing zone if in ivs it is about 47% plot burden to 54% plot burden it is an average of 50% plot burden it's an acceptable zone for landing your stent you take oct in oct what is the criteria for your stent edge landing zone that is an area with a lipid rich plot less than 180 degrees anything more than 180 degree that resulted in edge related problems and an area which is less than 4.1 mm square that resulted in edge related problems so ideally you identify a landing zone which is normal appearing in the proximal and distal part of your stand landing zone with a three layer appearance or a cross section with a lipid arc less than 180 degree in the presence of diffuse lesion that is how you identify landing zones and edge dissection is uh, a discontinuity in your intimal uh, intimal discontinuity is called your distant is called your dissection there are different uh, uh, terminologies used so morphologically it is classified into flap type dissection punch out dissection double lumen dissection or fissure type dissection and according to axial extent it is uh, uh, divided into intimal confined to intima medial extending to media and adventitial which is extending beyond media these are the various measurements the most important measurements are the arc of dissection flap residual human area the third one is the length of the dissection these are the three parameters which it decide your outcomes so what are the predictors of its dissection vessel overstretching that is increased strength to artery ratio then the presence of atherosclerotic disease at the edges particularly the presence of fibrous calcific block eccentric block and thin cap fibrosiroma these decide the uh, occurrence of your edge dissections most of this oct detected dissections are minor they heal during follow up without any adverse events so most of the dissections you don't have to address it the mechanism of healing is layering or tacking down rather than the filling the cavities in block material just uh, this is a layering of your thrombus material that is then formation of endothelium that is how all your dissections heal and which are the dissection predict poor healing or adverse outcomes presence of angiographic flow compromise maximum flap length more than 250 microns dissection flap thickness more than 310 microns presence of double lumen dissection presence of le smaller uh, residual lumen area less than 4.5 mm square and the presence of reference vessel disease and presence of distal edge dissections comparing to proximal edge dissection and extension into the media and extension for more than 2 mm so these are the parameters that predict the poor outcomes in case of edge dissections and uh, what the guidelines recommend of uh, which dissections to be treated dissections which occurred in an area with a large residual clot burden and a lateral extension of more than 60 degree longitudinal extension of more than 2 mm and involvement of media and localization to be disabled so these are the things you have to look into and fix these dissections because they result in adverse events during follow up this is an example of a distal edge dissection after implantation of a long stent in a lady just see that this dissection occurred in distal edge and it occurred in an area with a large block and it extended into the media it is about more than 60 mic 60 degrees in the circumference and the compromise the lumen a lot so it met all the criteria for an edge dissection that needed treatment you can just see that area is only about 2 mm right you put an additional stent to cover this dissection okay what about intramural hematoma intramural hematoma is an accumulation of blood or flesh medium within the medial space it is an extension of dissection you just see here this is your uh, orange one is your intima 
and the yellow one is your media. So you just see that edge, the dissection extending into the media. The blood seeps in, and it does. It uh, has no way, uh, no way out. So that's why it just accumulates in the media. That causes a lumen compromise. So why this is very important? It occurs in about seven percent of the PCI, and most commonly occurs in the distal reference. And more importantly, one third of the cases there is no significant abnormality noted on angiography. It results in higher incidence of non-QMI, repeat revascularization, and sudden death. So you have to address any hematoma you notice at the edges because there is high incidence of event rate. This is an example here. This is an L6 lesion. Stent was implanted. Smooth appearing narrowing. We gave multiple injections of nitroglycerin that did not disappear. We did an OCT imaging. Can you see here? Here you can just see that there is the accumulation of blood in the media. So this is a typical appearance of your edge intramural hematoma. So again, you see the 3D image. This is a smooth appearing your hematoma that resulted in human compromise with the human area of 1.9 millimeter square. We just put an additional stent to fix this uh, uh, dissection. This uh, hematoma. This is how the final image. So any hematoma, notice and they just try to fix it because it results in adverse events. Okay, finally, what about the tissue prolapse? Uh, tissue prolapse is nothing but presence of the tissue or thrombus within the stent. There are three types of tissue prolapses. It's four types, uh, actually. One is a smooth prolapse. It's nothing but the stent set just compresses soft uh, appearing flaw. This you can just see this bobbing into the lumen. So it appears very smooth. So this is the least form of vessel wall injury called smooth tissue prolapse. What is disturbed to fibrous tissue prolapse? It is nothing but we just damage the fibrous flap that the flap is protruding into your stem cells. This is called disturbed fibrous tissue prolapse. And the fourth one is you have a thin cap fibrotheroma. The stem the strut has gone into it. All the necrotic material is protruding. That is called irregular tissue prolapse. These two, this is a mild form of injury, milder form of injury, and this is severe form of injury. This has been associated with increased adverse events. When you have a prolapse which is more than 250 micron thickness, that is classified as thrombus. So this is more common in ACS lesions. And if you see the outcomes wise, the, the irregular prolapse has same, uh, almost same type of outcome as with your underexpanded stent. So we all know underexpanded stent is the most important critical outcome. You can just see the same amount of uh, outcome uh, events caused by your irregular tissue prolapse. Okay. And another study has shown that tissue prolapse more than 500 microns have been associated with the event rate. So when you find a big tissue prolapse, we nobody knows what is the exact criteria. When you feel that it is compromised in your lumen, just to do additional balloon dilatation to correct this. Or in case of thrombus, try to do thrombosuction. There is no specific criteria. One study that is Harrison AMI, which has shown that the lumen area less than four millimeter square uh, residual lumen area that is associated with stent thrombosis. And Illumin 3 defined uh, the criteria for addressing your tissue prolapse. Anything more than compromising a lumen more than 10% needs addressing. So to summarize, how do you optimize your stent? Uh, uh, you have to get an area of more than 90% of the proximal reference and more than 90% of the distal reference are an absolute area of more than 5 millimeter square uh, for your bare metal stand and 5.5 millimeter square for, uh, sorry, 5.5 for bare metal stand and 5 millimeter square for your drug routing stand. And uh, there is no major edge dissection, no major edge disease, and no major tissue prolapse. You achieve all these uh, six parameters, your event rate is less than 1.5%. Okay, one, two words about the follow-up examination. So because of its high resolution, it helps in uh, you, uh, uh, screening patients for tissue coverage of your sensors. Similar to opposition, tissue coverage is defined, uh, differentiated into three types. One is embedded and covered. The second one is protruding and uncovered. Protruding and covered. The third one is protruding and covered. And the fourth one is malar post and can cover. So this is how we classify stent set coverage. And about neoendema characteristics, three types of neoendema have been characterized. One is the homogeneous neoendema. Second one is layered neoendema. The third one is heterogeneous neoendema. This has a good prognosis, intermediate prognosis, and poor prognosis in a non-stenotic tissue. When you have a stenotic tissue, 
this has the poor prognosis because it is very very difficult to expand the homogeneous new antima these two relatively easy to expand and put regularity in balloon or regular and finally what is neoatherosclerosis neoatherosclerosis is nothing but development of atherosclerotic changes in the new antima this here you just see that this is intact fibrosperma this is calcium inside and this is your red thrombus and this is your white thrombus and this is your mixed thrombus and this is your plaque rupture so all this can occur inside the new antima that is called neoatherosclerosis and this is uh, an important parameter we already explained this is the near tacred molar position it's nothing but uh, the vessel wall receding away from the stent surge usually producing the cauliflower or irregular appearance on your angiography this is the last slide so how does you can use uh, uh, how do you can use uh, oct for uh, diagnosing stent failure all the stent early restenosis are due to neoantimal hyperplasia or your procedural factors such as under expansion and edge disease uh, geographic miss these are the most important predictors of early stent thrombosis and late stent thrombosis uh, usually occur from uncovered stent sets and stent uh, uh, new atherosclerosis and uh, taking into restenosis uh, both with diametral and brachial looking stents mostly results from new antimal hyperplasia stent fracture and the late events results from new and new atherosclerosis mainly both with brachial looking stents a diameter stent thank you i think uh, i took a bit longer uh, no, no, so it's very, it's, very it's, nice talk which no, i just okay. lost this nice. okay at this and any questions sir it is uh, um there is one question about how okay. do you avoid uh, how do you align the catheter if you find the catheter is leaning towards one side how do you yeah. any technique to avoid that Uh, uh, that is, uh, you, you have to just align the guide catheter coaxial. It is proximally, since it is reasonably okay, you just avoid align your guide catheter coaxially. So then your catheter also will be in the middle. But uh, most of the time, it is very difficult to get a, a center position because once you have a six millimeter left mine, five millimeter left mine, it is very difficult to get it. And it is one artifact uh, unless it is a small vessel where where you can engage your catheter coaxially. It is very difficult to avoid this artifact. the most important thing is you have to recognize this so that if you measure the dimension it will be 6 mm you should not select the 6 mm uh, balloon it is actually a 3 mm or 3.5 mm vessel so that is the message uh, you should recognize this artifact and avoid your oversizing of your balloon or stent um it's a question about uh, jerry views uh, super line Uh, tissue tissue prolapse yes tissue prolapse is it due to over dilatation yeah it is mainly occurs in acs patients so uh, it's an interesting article by dr joins group so they divided into three it's so most of the studies have shown that two except two iva studies all the studies have shown there is no relationship between tissue prolapse and events two iva studies one is harrison ami study the another study from korea which has shown that uh, more tissue prolapse you have and higher incidence of stent thrombosis but none of the studies have defined the what is the exact amount of tissue prolapse that decides your outcomes but the most probably you have what you have to see whether it is compromising if the lumen area is very big little amount of tissue prolapse you can just leave it alone suppose more than 50% of your stent is uh, occupied by your tissue prolapse uh, then you have to do something to uh, remove that prolapse because they may result in particularly when it is a necrotic material because it's highly thrombogenic that is why this irregular tissue prolapse is associated with more events okay then you have to do something either you do thrombosuction if you suppose you feel it is all thrombus or you have to do prolonged balloon dilatation which can just uh, plaster the tissue prolapse to the vessel wall the so worst scenario you have to put a stent with multiple connectors so it can say additional stent it can say the tissue prolapse. but most of the situations it is innocuous and mainly it occurs with, uh, due to uh, soft tissue necrotic core what you have in acs lesions um it was excellent uh, vijay kumar this is shiva uh, i think you, no sir. one else and uh, i don't think uh, anyone else can take you to such a depth of uh, basics i can understand uh, how you understand I think this concept he, he, the way you, you all do more than me what i do <laughs> the understanding is most important and the way you took us an artifact was uh, tremendous
I will just quickly may, because already we are half an hour late. Nine o'clock already. Nine o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Regarding this calcium, uh, which you described calcific nodule, there is a paper in 2019 Jack. It's a one paper uh, retrospectively analyzed the ACS patients of 2000 and odd, where yeah. they subsequently divided into three categories: superficial yeah. sheets of calcium. Again, the Jack Jank group. They they are all, all the same AC group. Same group. Yeah. Same group. So they divided right. into eruptive nodules. Three groups. Yeah, eruptive yeah. nodule. And eruptive yeah. nodule. Pro, uh, pro, uh, means nodal arc protrusion. And the third I one is I have a question your, for you here. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this uh, calcific nodule which is quite common in RCA mid because of the torsion. And there is a red thrombus because the uh, fibrous yeah. cap is disrupted. How do you yeah. differentiate in total? Because this is basically basic sinusity. Red thrombus from this calcific nodule. Yeah, it is It is. It is, more, it is very difficult when you have a protruding uh, nodule. That is eruptive nodule with overlaying uh, thrombus. That makes your interpretation very difficult. The easiest thing is you just move a frame behind and forth. Go move this okay. side and the other side. If you have a lot of calcium, and right. it is the calcified nodule. That is how easily you can just identify this. So you just nodule. figure it out. Uh, look for the area just of move calcium. And that is that is the criteria move. that has been used for calcified. If you see the criteria, I just quickly go back. Uh, <coughs> if you just second. That is how you identify your. So you have to just move front and back, and uh, then right. if you see That's more calcium, it is highly. Th this is the one. You just see that calcified nodule. How they define protruding nodal or calcium. Right. Attached thrombus. We have superficial calcium, substantive calcium, proximal, and distal to the lesion. So that is how you identify calcified nodule. And this exactly looks like a red thrombus, right? It is not like calcium. So you just move front right, and back exactly. and see that. Yeah. I think Mohan, it's time to call it off. If uh, no more questions. Yeah, yeah. Because. Uh, yeah, definitely. So there is a the the another uh, program which has been on 17th. I would like to tell to everyone that uh, again uh, Vijay Kumar is going to be on talk on the next level of OCT, what to be done, and the basics of left main approach and the basics of uh, a bifurcation approach by Dr. Shiva Kumar. So we have a three panelists on the on 17th of uh, this month to kindly uh, uh, be on that day for uh, bombard with all your questions. Thank you, Mohan, and uh, thank, thank you, Vijay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah, Kumar. thanks, thank everyone. Thank thanks, Vijay, because. actually, thank uh, for the for the thing. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, all the one, everyone who came thanks. for the webinar, and uh, and we'll save uh, any questions left over for next time. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Morgan. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye. India's Karun.